Judges 6. We'll begin there in just a few moments. And of course, we urge everybody to be as the noble-minded Bereans and search the scriptures to see if what I say, Adam says, Jeff says, or anyone says it gets up here is from the word of God. And so please go ahead and open to Judges 6. We'll begin there in just a few moments. Before that, um, none of us are intimidated by a few inches of snow and uh, the inclement weather that may be around us. However, uh, because of the timing of this particular storm, um, we've decided to not meet this evening. So we wanna make that announcement now so everyone can know it and spread the word that we will not plan on meeting this evening at 5.30 because of the timing of the storm. It will probably be coming during the time of our meeting and there's just no way for Michael and Matthew to keep up with the snow, whatever may be falling at that time. And so um, they put salt down, we really appreciate that. And that helps and it is definitely proactive. But uh, because of the timing of this thing, we're not planning on meeting this Sunday evening. Of course, we'll meet Lord willing on Wednesday evening at seven o'clock. The other announcement I wanna make at this time is we've asked the deacons to go ahead and arrange a time to meet with the policeman to help secure the building for obvious reasons. Uh, the, the direction that our culture is going in right now is not good as far as law enforcement is concerned. And many people feel unsafe and insecure in their meeting places. And so don't be surprised if you see a policeman come in after services Wednesday evening is going to walk through the building with the deacons and Charlie Becknell, and uh, they're, he's going to provide a number of suggestions to help secure this meeting place when we're assembled together. We appreciate the deacons doing this, setting this up, and Brother Charlie also being a part of that. So that will be going on, Lord willing, this Wednesday evening. Let's go ahead and get into our study now in, uh, from Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6, uh, Judge Gideon will ask a very, very uh, challenging question here. In Judges chapter 6, look with me at uh, verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abias Rite, as his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. Verse 12, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Then Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this befallen us? Where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. And so Gideon raises this very, very important question. It is a question that strikes at the very heart of every child of God at some point in their lifetime, maybe several times. And that is, if the Lord is with us, then why have all these things, whatever they may be, befallen us? Why are we having all these problems? And because we're having these problems, does that mean God is not with us or that God does not care about us? These are very important questions. And because a, a, a Christian is sometimes given an inadequate answer to those questions, or a foolish answer to those questions, maybe a superficial answer to those questions, he or she may decide for whatever reason to lose their spiritual bearings and stop serving the Lord for a while because they just can't make some kind of meaningful sense out of the suffering or the trials that they're going through. And so they lose their spiritual bearings. That is, of course, one of the main reasons the letter to the Hebrews was written. You have people, Christians, who were suffering terribly during that time, and they didn't understand. They didn't know why they were facing all of these trials. They couldn't make sense of the suffering. And so 
Here the, the Hebrew letter comes, which he calls a short letter of exhortation. I love to read one of his long letters. And he assures them of certain things. He reminds them of truths that are certain, absolute, which most of them had heard maybe a number of times. But he's helping them make sense of their trials. In chapter 12, those whom the Lord loves. He chastens and he reminds them of a number of things that God had taught them about trials and certain things that are true. And following then the example of that this morning, we're going to follow the pattern of making sense of suffering by remembering things we know to be certain, things to be definite. But even the Hebrew writer, look at chapter two, even the Hebrew writer, chapter two, says this in verse one. As he's reminding Christians of things that are certain, they know to be absolutely right. He says, how shall we escape? Chapter two, verse one, if we neglect so great a salvation. And then in chapter three, 12 and 13, take care, brethren, lest there be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God. And so even though he's working with them to remember certain truths that are definite, absolute, things that already been taught about, he says, if you fall away, if you neglect so great a salvation, there's no justification for that. He'll say in chapter four that there remains a Sabbath rest, verse nine, for the people of God. This, this life is not the time for rest. Here we must work while it's still day. Night comes when no man can work. But where there is a place coming where there is eternal rest. And so let's look forward to that place. And so the point I'm making is, brother and sister, it just won't do for us to, to lose our spiritual bearings and just forget sometimes who we are, who God is, and especially in view of eternity that's rapidly approaching. We need to continue to bear fruit. And like the Hebrew writer and the people he's addressing there, remember the things that we do know. When, when suffering and trials come into our lives as they have into mine as well as yours, and you say, I, I just can't make sense of it. I don't understand it. We've all been there. Well, what do you know? What is certain to you? And when we think of what we do know, it will help us get past the things that we sometimes don't know, we don't understand. Remember this, God understands all about pain and suffering and what it takes to endure it, especially when you consider his, his thinking, his understanding that is cemented in the cross of his own beloved son. God understands all about this. God's own son went through terrible pain and suffering, betrayed by Judas, nailed to a wooden stake, terrible pain and suffering. He just, though he, he went through that, he endured the cross, Hebrews 12 says, and despised the shame. He is a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Look at Hebrews 5 and what the Hebrew writer says about what Jesus went through. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse 7. In the days of his flesh, when he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to him who was able to save him from death, Remember the garden scene. And who he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made complete or perfect, he became to all who obey him the source of eternal salvation. A man whose son had actually been the victim of a drunk driver. 
who died as a result of a decision made by a drunk driver. In bitter tears, ask a friend, where was God when all these terrible things happened to my boy? His friend very wisely answered, God was in the same place he was when his own son was suffering and dying at the hands of very wicked people. God understands all about pain and suffering. He understands what it takes to endure it. Whatever suffering we may be going through now or have to go through in this life, God has felt it, all of it, especially through the life, the suffering, and the cruel death of his only son. Remember this also, that God is not the cause of your pain and suffering. He may relieve your pain and suffering. He may help us to endure that pain and suffering. He can certainly help us to make sense of that pain and suffering if we'll stop complaining long enough to listen. But God is not the cause of the pain and suffering. I want you to consider with me Luke chapter 13 for a moment. Luke chapter 13. Among the many miracles of Jesus, we see this one here in verse 11. Behold, there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. Verse 12, and when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands upon her, and immediately she was made erect again and began to glorify God. In verse 16, this woman, Jesus said later, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan hath bound for 18 long years. The fact that Jesus adds that word long, what does that show? Compassion. Jesus says those were long years of suffering that Satan brought upon her. He says, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? Sometimes when suffering comes, we hear someone say, why did God send this suffering into my life? Why did God allow this to happen? And sometimes a person with even less understanding says, I guess this was just God's will that he sent this. And so God ends up getting the blame for some horrendous thing that he had nothing to do with. How would you like it if you were blamed for a crime you didn't commit? In Luke 13 and verse 16, Jesus said, Satan bound this woman. Jesus, in grace and mercy, released her from that suffering. Satan bound her. Jesus released her. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we see the same truth. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Beginning there at verse 7. Paul says of a, a revelation that was given to him because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us that this thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan to buffet him. To be released from this suffering, whatever it was, Paul turned to the Lord. He besought the Lord three times 
But each time the Lord answered, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. But I want you to see that Paul knew that the true source of his affliction was the devil, not the Lord. Paul also understood something extremely important, and that is that in this life, our comfort is not the most important thing. It's not most important that we be happy. It's most important that we be holy. It's not most important that we be comfortable. What's most important, Paul understood, is that we be complete and perfected in Jesus Christ. And no one knows that better than, of course, our Heavenly Father. And so in verse 9, Paul says, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I'm well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions and difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so God's power was being perfected in that weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in him. And that is the ultimate goal, and that is present every man complete in Jesus Christ, Colossians 1.28. And sometimes that means that we need to become uncomfortable, maybe, in our lives to get out of our comfort zone. Galatians chapter 6, consider this also, Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians 6, verse 7, Adam touched on this, this truth in his class this morning. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. A person sows to his own flesh, and from his flesh he will reap corruption. One who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. Based on this truth, which is an absolute truth physically as well as spiritually, much of the suffering we face in this world, brethren, is the result of bad choices. It's not necessarily your choice, but just somebody's bad choice so somewhere along the path of history. A brother's wife, a dear brother in Christ, his wife was driving her car when a young man ran a stop sign, driving a truck, and killed her instantly. Hugh Berry's daughter, Hugh Berry's daughter, died because someone in the house next door was cleaning a gun, and the gun went off. Two climbers, Tim Klein, Jason Wells, fell to their death while climbing El Capitan in 2018, as just about every year somebody falls to their death while attempting to climb El Capitan. And then I know of a man who, uh, for whatever reason, stepped in front of a semi-truck on Interstate 70 a few years ago and, of course, died instantly. If a man gets no exercise and he eats the wrong kind of foods for years and becomes a heart attack risk, whose fault is that? Brethren, there are universal absolute laws in place in this world, and this world could not exist unless they are in place. And just because you or I make a bad decision, God doesn't suspend the law because we make a bad decision. If he did, this world couldn't exist. We couldn't live here. Two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. If a man walks in front of a truck, he's going to die. And if I make the foolish decision to walk off of this cliff, there's this thing called gravity, and God doesn't suspend that because I made a really bad decision. These laws exist, and if they didn't exist, we couldn't exist. Human dishonesty and greed often cause crimes and resulting pain. Human hatred and arrogance lead to prejudice, resulting problems. Human lust 
brings about immorality and resulting problems. Human desires lead to lack of self-control and addictions and diseases, human carelessness, often foolish accidents. Because a man makes a bad choice, is God to blame because he created man? If we blame God for the bad things in this world, who do we credit for the good? How do we thank God if we're blaming him for something that's bad? James says, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above, from whom there's no variation or shifting shadow. Solomon understood it well. He said, God made man upright, but he has sought out many, many devices. Bad choices, not necessarily our own, but just bad choices being made in this world is the cause of much of our suffering. When troubles come and you don't know why, remember this also, that you are not unique. You're not unique. You're not being singled out among all humanity to go through this. And so rather than say, why me? Why this? Why now? Why so much of this? Understand there are fewer experiences more universally peculiar to the human family than that of suffering. Look at the early Christians in 2 Corinthians 6. Look at uh, some of the things they were going through. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 4, he says, In everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, in distresses, in beatings and imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, sleeplessness, in hunger. Verse 9, as unknown yet well known, dying yet behold we live, as punished yet not put to death, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet we possess all things. Amen. In addition to normal sicknesses, these Christians faced terrible persecutions. Oh, they had their share of normal sicknesses. Timothy had a stomach infirmity of some kind, and Epaphroditus had some kind of sickness that nearly killed him. But Paul and others prayed for him, and Paul says, lest we have sorrow upon sorrow. I love the way he said that. God healed Epaphroditus. Job said it this way. He said, man who's born of woman is short-lived and full of trouble. Brethren, we live in a sin-cursed world. There are fewer experiences more universally peculiar to mankind than that of suffering. It's not a question of if, but when and how. How we're going to deal with it whenever it comes. James 1 says, count it all joy that you may be perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. Let it help you to grow and not be a stumbling block. Remember that suffering in this life also provides an opportunity to put our convictions to the test. Matthew chapter 26, our brother Mike read from this a few moments ago. Here was Peter in that same chapter. And he very boldly, proudly says to Jesus, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 33, he says, I will never desert you. Though all these others may desert you, he says, I'm your man. I'll stand by you. I will never desert you. That was easy for Peter to say that in the presence of Jesus. It wasn't so easy when he was standing by that campfire surrounded by unbelievers, was it? And the servant girl recognized Peter and she said, I think he's one of his disciples also. And Peter denied it. And she said, no, she said, you got, you got that Galilean hillbilly accent. I, I'm pretty sure you're one of his disciples. And Peter says, and he, and he denies it with an oath, invoke the name of God. 
And then she persisted and she said, yeah, I'm sure you're one of them. And Peter then cursed and swore. And when he denied Jesus that third time, as Jesus had prophesied the cock crew, the second time, Luke's account says Jesus looked at him. Can you imagine Jesus looking right through into your soul, into your heart, what that would do to you? Well, what it did to Peter was he went out and he wept bitterly. He wept like a baby. Thank God he wept like a baby in sorrow and true conviction. Jesus said, Peter, you're going to do this, and I prayed for you, and when you return, strengthen your brethren. I've often wondered, what if Jesus hadn't prayed for Peter? The power of intercessory prayer. So here's Peter, and he's saying, Lord, I'll never forsake you, but when he's in the world, it's a different story. It's easy for us today. In a, a group of people who believe much the same thing about God, his word, about Jesus, to make bold assertions about what we're going to do. We believe this and we believe that. And this is the way the world is. It won't be so easy this week when you go back to work, will it? It won't be so easy when you go back to school, will it? When you get around your friends and your peers, get around your neighbors, it won't be so easy. It will be an opportunity, however, for you and your faith to be tested. The true conviction in your heart is going to be tested this week. How will you do? Hopefully you'll do better than, than Peter did on this occasion. Second Corinthians 1, the Apostle Paul has something to say about this also. Second Corinthians 1, in verse 8 and 9. <clears throat> He says, we don't want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength so that we despaired even of life. I wish we had more about that and what happened. But Paul says, we thought we were going to die. Verse 9, he says, indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves. And then he says this, so that, in my Bible, I have, there's three so that's in this chapter I have circled, and this is one of them. Here's one of the reasons why trials come sometimes. He says, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Troubles remind us that we need help. They remind us that there are forces in this world greater than ourselves. We are not self-sufficient, far from it. That we're not as strong and we're not as smart as we thought we were. We need help. We need God's help, number one, and we need one another's help, such as we're receiving this morning. We need our brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Remember that it, it has a way of testing the validity of your faith. And in that way, it's a good thing. It shows us the depth of that faith. Remember also that God understands pain and suffering. He understands what it takes to endure it. His understanding is cemented in the suffering and death of his own son. Remember that God is not the cause of your pain or suffering. Satan is. God may allow it. He may relieve it. He may help you endure it. He will definitely help you make sense of it if you'll listen to him. But he's not the cause. Much of the suffering we face is the result of bad choices. Our own choices or the choices of other people. There are absolute laws of cause and effect that are established in this world. And if we break ourselves against one of those laws, there are consequences. You never really, we talk about breaking the law, but if it's an absolute law, you don't break the law. You'll break yourself against it. The law stands, it's absolute. Remember that we're not unique. We're not being singled out in this suffering. It is the common law of all people. What is unique is how we respond to it. 
hopefully in greater trust in the Lord. Suffering provides an opportunity to put our true convictions to the test, to learn to trust in the Lord even more, as Abraham did, as Job did, certainly if those men, then we can. And concerning Job, Job said this one time. He said, there is a place where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. And Job longed for that place. I do too. There are times when, like the Hebrew writer, the rest of God is what I want. But Jesus reminds us that this, this life is not the time for rest. Let's work while it's still day. For night comes when no man can work. But there is a place of rest. And there is a place where the, where the weary and all the suffering and the trial, uh, trials of this life can be over. And that's a place God promises all who remain faithful until their last breath. I know of a young lady who was also hit by a drunk driver. And uh, it so affected her that at one point she couldn't remember her street. She couldn't remember her own address. Uh, a man, a brother came to visit her. And uh, after the visit was over, he, he was speaking to the father. And he said, you know, I can see real improvement in her. I can see that she's getting stronger than my last visit. And then he said, God is truly good. And the father at that point thanked the man. He said, brother, thank you for coming to visit my daughter. I'm sure you were only an encouragement to her. He said, but I want you to understand something very important that her mother and I and my daughter understand. And that is, God is good all the time. He doesn't need to heal my daughter to prove that to me. God is good all the time, regardless of what happens to her, what happens to me, what happens to you physically. In this physical body, there is a place waiting us where all that suffering and pain that comes from living in this sin-cursed world will pass away. Our God is good, and he has that place waiting for us. Whatever pain and suffering we may endure in this life, remember, it is temporary. 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, I can't even compare. There's no comparison between what I'm enduring right now and what God has waiting for me, the eternal weight of glory. He said it's far, far surpasses anything I might have to go through in this life. And so the message is, hang in there and don't let go. Keep hanging to your heavenly Father, clinging to the promises he's given us. Those are promises that can be yours and you're the salvation that God has for you. You can come to know the goodness of the Lord, Hosea writes about. And that last statement's a great statement, brother. I'm glad you ended with that. God is right. Trust in the Lord. He is right. His ways are right. We are often wrong, but God is right. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body, refreshment to your bones. Come to the Lord while he's waiting for you. Will you as we stand and as we sing, please? <clears throat>